Yes. Yay. Yes. Yes, you did it. Is it working? Okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, nice. Okay. Yep. I have such a good Great. doctor of science uh, joke right now and I can't do it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because I Fine. Okay, be... you did it. I am so <laughs> competent. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> That is an achievement. Thank you. All right. Uh, start then. Um, oh, are we waiting for more people to join? I think we still have uh, fewer than should be here. So maybe we'll go down for another <coughs> five, five, two or three minutes and then start then. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, maybe uh, uh, Dr. Boyd could uh, check whether she can share the. Oh, yeah, yeah. We slides. should probably unshare these slides, right? Do you, yeah. you have slides that you'd like to share? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Here, let me, yeah. let me try. Is that okay? Yes. I can see them at least. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we can start. I think people will be joining. Yep. Okay. Uh, shall I start recording or? Yeah. Uh, yeah Abhishek, yeah. you want to do that or should I do that? Then I'm going to make you a co-host, Abhishek. You record since you have the other one as well. Yep. Are you there, Abhishek? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I was speaking with my mic on mute. Ah, I see. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. I made you a co-host. You, uh, you can start the recording. I'll start okay. once you think about it. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, thank you all for being here. So uh, this is the first in our series of thematic talks for the Winter School. Uh, the idea being that we have a talk on the same theme as the introductory lecture uh, at uh, the beginning of the day. And today, Shinod talked to you earlier today about uh, experiments uh, in the philosophy of science. And so uh, we're going to have a talk uh, on that broad theme. I'm sure uh, going into more depth about some of the topics you discussed uh, earlier today. Um, and uh, joining us today to give the talk uh, is Dr. Nora Boyd, who is a um, philosopher of science working at Siena University. And uh, she um, works uh, on mainly on empiricist philosophy of science, um, uh, particularly involving astrophysics. And since She's interested in empiricism. She also knows a great deal about experimentation, uh, uh, which is what we're going to be hearing about today. Uh, the title of the talk is Calibration, the Experimenter's Regress, and the Role Commissioning in the Epistemology of Experiment. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful talk. And uh, once the talk is done, I'll open up the floor to questions from all of you. So uh, please pay attention. Think of uh, things you want to talk about. And uh, yeah, uh, go ahead, uh, Professor Boyd. Thank you so much. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Good. Hopefully the internet here at school um, stays with us <laughs> for the duration of this session, but uh, we, can, we can just hope. <clears throat> so um, yes, my, my talk today is about the experimenter's regress, calibration and the role of commissioning in, in the epistemology of experiment. Um, so let's Let's just start with a with a sort of imaginary situation. So imagine that I built this detector. Uh, it's a brand new kind of detector that's supposed to detect a brand new kind of particle called the mystery particle. And until now, no one has ever detected a mystery particle at all. So I want you to use the detector to try and detect mystery particles to see if they really exist. Imagine that you turn the detector on and after a while it beeps, which is what it's supposed to do when it has successfully detected a mystery particle. So what would you think? Would you conclude that you have successfully detected a mystery particle using this new detector? 
While it would be very exciting to have made the first ever, ever mystery particle detection, there are some considerations that might make you cautious <clears throat> about declaring your success. What if the detector picked up some noise rather than a mystery particle? And it was the noise that made it beep. What if there was some subtle malfunction inside the mystery particle detector that caused it to accidentally beep? It seems like in order to <clears throat> um, successfully detect a mystery particle, you need a functioning mystery particle detector, but that the way to tell that you indeed have a functioning mystery particle detector is to check to see if it successfully detects mystery particles. But in order to tell that your detector successfully detects mystery particles, you need to already be assured that you have a functioning mystery particle detector. So how are you supposed to make any progress with the mystery particle detector? This puzzle is what sociologist Harry Collins has famously called the experimenter's regress. And if instead of thinking about an imaginary mystery particle detector, we think about a real scientific apparatus, it looks like the puzzle only gets worse. As two gravitational wave scientists put it, quote, in a modern complex experiment, distinguishing new science from an instrument artifact or a routine occurrence may be far from obvious. So how is it that scientists decide when the results of their experiments should be taken seriously? When are they convinced that they have functioning detectors? Suppose that when you suggest that my new mystery particle detector may have beeped in response to noise or due to some internal malfunction, I get super offended and say, how dare you question my expertise as a detector maker? I'm one of the world's finest. What if there's a Nobel Prize at stake? In the so-called science wars, a period of vigorous debate between sociologists of science and philosophers of science, some sociologists argued that non-epistemic factors like deference to power and desire for prestige determine scientists' decisions including their decisions about when to take the results from a new scientific instrument seriously. Philosophers of science saw this view from sociologists as an attack on the epistemology of science, the justification of scientific knowledge, and the special and distinctive status of science in comparison to other human activities um, as a knowledge producing enterprise. If the decisions that scientists make about when to take results seriously are epistemically justified, then they would not be determined by factors like power and prestige. But is it actually the case that these crucial decisions scientists make, like when to take results seriously, are made with the support of good epistemic reasons? That is, are decisions to take scientific results seriously in fact epistemically justified, or at least generally justified or justified in most cases? After all, it seems clear that sometimes scientists make unjustified decisions under the strong influence of sociological factors. Scientists sometimes let their hopes, fears, and egos get the best of them. One striking relatively recent example is the BICEP2 debacle. BICEP2 was an experiment looking for the telltale signs of cosmic inflation in the polarization pattern of our universe's primordial light, the cosmic microwave background. The BICEP2 team published results claiming the discovery of the smoking gun signature of cosmic inflation, which by some accounts would imply the existence of a multiverse, but later had to retract this claim. In a memoir describing the episode from within the collaboration, cosmologist Brian Keating <clears throat> explains how he, at least, was strongly motivated by the possibility of winning a Nobel Prize if the research was successful. The goal is, <laughs> he writes, quote, as with the lunar landing and the South Pole, there is no Nobel Prize for second place. The goal is to be the scientist who makes the first discovery, the one for the ages, and the one who wins winning the Nobel Prize confers the ultimate capital. Indeed, Keating claims that competition for the prize let fear and greed cloud the judgment of the BICEP2 researchers. The key misstep happened when the BICEP2 researchers rushed a step in data analysis in the hope of beating their competition, the Planck co collaboration, to the results. The problem for the BICEP2 collaboration was that their competitors were the only ones who held some key data that BICEP2 needed in order to complete its analysis. Keating claims that despite efforts on, part, on the part of the BICEP2 team to get the Planck folks to share the key data, the Planck collaboration would not cooperate. Then the BICEP2 team found that one member of the Planck team had posted a talk that contained a preliminary map of the key data online. In Keating's memoir, he describes what the members of the BICEP2 collaboration felt when they found that slide online. He writes, 
It was a treasure map with polarized X's marking the spot of Nobel gold. As soon as we discovered it, one of our team members digitized Bernard's slide, revealing by extrapolation the formerly forbidden Planck, Planck data. We knew it was an unorthodox approach. In fact, it didn't sit well with many of us. We took unpublished data, a single qualitative image, and digitized it, turning it into, into quantitative information. Unfortunately for the BICEP2 team, the map on the slide had not yet been appropriately processed by the Planck collaboration for the use that the BICEP2 team put it to. So after their premature announcements and public celebration racing for the prize, the BICEP2 team ultimately was humiliated and had to retract their claim to having discovered the signature of cosmic inflation and evidence supporting the existence of the multiverse. This seems like a clear case where the decision to take the results of the experiment seriously were not epistemically justified and were driven primarily by sociological factors, at least on the side of the BICEP2 collaboration. Are all or even many scientific decisions like this? Or is this more like a fluke, a striking but relatively unusual mistake in judgment? So in today's talk, I'm gonna take up this question about whether the decisions that scientists make about when to take the results of scientific research seriously are indeed epistemically justified. To do this, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time talking about Harry Collins's um, experimenter's regress and the threat it poses to the epistemology of science. Well, then I'll introduce Alan Franklin's response to Collins in which Franklin argues that the mundane process of calibration neutralizes the threat posed by the regress, thereby restoring the integrity of the epistemology of science and the special status of science among other human pursuits. Next, I'll raise another more recent challenge to the epistemology of science, uh, this time stemming from Aaron Tall's work on calibration in the epistemology of measurement. And while I certainly won't resolve all of the issues that um, Tall's epistemology of measurement raises for the justification of scientific knowledge here today, I'll point out where I think um, the promising directions and where the really difficult problems lie. Finally, I'll suggest that while philosophers of science interested in the epistemology of science and the epistemology of experiment in particular have paid quite a bit of attention to the issue of calibration, they have not yet paid attention at all to a relatively nearby topic um, where I actually think most of the epistemic action, so to speak, really is. Um, that topic is commissioning or the commissioning phase of an experiment. So at the very end of my talk, I'll say something very briefly about what commissioning is and why it should receive greater attention from philosophers of science moving forward. So in this talk, I'm drawing on material from the final chapter of my recent Cambridge Element titled Epistemology of Experimental Physics, which was published just within the last couple of weeks. <clears throat> um, it's a short book in an edited series on philosophy of physics that's meant to introduce topics um, to scholars such as yourselves. And this book deals with questions like, how should we understand the reasoning exhibited in experimental physics? When does the reasoning go awry? To what extent can the epistemology of experimental physics be articulated and justified? So if you'd like to learn more about these topics, um, that's where I would point you. So to start, let me make a couple of remarks on terminology. Philosophers of science sometimes use terms in a way that you might find surprising from the perspective of other parts of philosophy. So in the way that I'll use the term here, an epistemology is something that helps us to make sense of how some form of knowledge is gained. It articulates the structures and moves appropriate for certain epistemic activities. And when I refer to experiments um, here or experimental physics, I just mean, I, I mean a very, very permissive understanding of experiment <laughs> that includes activities like observation and detection. Um, in addition to, uh, to, more, to manipulative experiments. In fact, I think the more general phrase, uh, empirical research would probably be more apt, but sometimes I'll say experiment here. Okay. So in what seems um, to me one of, it, it seems to me that one of the biggest threats to the epistemology uh, of experiment is encapsulated in Harry Collins's experimenter's regress, which I've already mentioned. In his 1985 uh, book, Changing Order, Collins expresses the crux of the regress by saying, we won't know if we have built a good detector until we've tried it and obtained the correct outcome, but we don't know what the correct outcome is until, and so on, ad infinitum. So again, we, to take a very simple example, um, suppose we come across a battery of unknown voltage. We have a voltmeter, but we don't know whether the scale, scale on the voltmeter is accurate or not. We could try and measure the voltage of the battery using this voltmeter, but the reading might uh, as well be arbitrary. 
To take the reading that the voltmeter supplies seriously, we'd want to be assured that it delivers the right voltage for the battery. But the whole problem is that we don't yet know what the voltage of the battery is. That's why we're trying to measure it with the voltmeter in the first place. So given this simple example, you probably already have some ideas uh, about how to get around this apparent problem. For example, if we have access to another battery, <laughs> uh, the voltage of which is already known, <laughs> then we could check to see if the scale on the voltmeter is accurate. If the voltmeter reads nine volts for a battery that we already know is a nine volt battery, then we can confidently use the voltmeter to determine the voltage of the battery of unknown voltage. And this is how Alan Franklin suggests um, scientists evade the experimenter's regress by calibrating their instruments. Franklin defines calibration as the use of a surrogate signal to standardize an instrument. So if we want to successfully use a voltmeter to determine the unknown voltage of a battery, we should first be sure that the voltmeter is well calibrated, that it reads the appropriate voltage when applied to a surrogate battery of known voltage. Once the instrument is properly calibrated, we have good epistemic reason to take the results it delivers seriously when applied to the battery of unknown voltage. In other words, Franklin argues that in practice, Collins's regress is truncated by calibration and that therefore calibration plays an important role in the epistemology of experiment. Indeed, calibration is a routine and ubiquitous aspect of scientific practice. Relatively simple measuring instruments like thermometers and scales must be calibrated. <clears throat> this picture comes from a um, machine shop guide showing how to calibrate um, a digital caliper using gauge blocks, which were specifically manufactured to have a st standard length. Here, the gauge block serves as the uh, the gauge blocks serve as the surrogates according to which the instrument is standardized through the process of calibration. But Harry Collins emphasizes that thinking about mundane cases like measuring battery voltages um, with a voltmeter or lengths with calipers uh, are misleading are misleadingly simple. The full force of the challenge of the experimenter's regress. Um, arises in cases where scientists hope to measure signals that have not yet been measured at all. He writes, the assumption built into this procedure is that the known unknown voltage acts upon the meter in the same way that the standard voltages um, which were applied to calibrate it. This is so slight an assumption as hardly to be worthy of the name. After all, a voltage is a voltage is a voltage. Nevertheless, it would be correct to say that during the calibration of a voltmeter, standardized voltages are used as a surrogate for as yet unmeasured signals. In more controversial science, the assumptions underlying the process of calibration are of greater moment. <clears throat> in other words, even in the case of measuring voltage, we have to make the assumption that the standard voltages used to calibrate the instrument are good surrogates for the unknown voltages that we want to measure. <clears throat> and perhaps this assumption seems justified in the case of voltages. But what if we consider efforts to calibrate instruments designed to detect or measure genuinely new signals for which there aren't any standard surrogate signals? Genuinely new signals thus seem to give the challenge that the experimenter's regress poses to the epistemology of experiment some force that can't be as easily dismissed by appealing to routine calibration. Indeed, Collins has extensively studied the way that scientists reason in a particular context in which they face a new type of signal, the search for gravitational waves. He's written multiple books on this topic. Um, before anyone had ever detected a gravitational wave, how could scientists justify thinking that they had functioning gravitational wave detectors? You can't just take a surrogate gravitational wave out of the supply cabinet in the way you can a nine volt battery. In order to see what makes the case of gravitational wave research so interesting for the epistemology of science, let me just give you a little bit of context. So gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein following his general theory of relativity. Gravitational waves dissipate energy from certain physical systems and travel through space-time. Gravitational waves from merging astrophysical objects of extraordinary mass, such as black holes and neutron stars, could travel through space-time and pass through detectors on Earth. And these passing waves would manifest as subtle but characteristic changes in distance. Joseph Weber was an early pioneer in efforts to construct detectors on Earth that would be sensitive to gravitational waves. Weber designed a detector that consisted of a large aluminum cylinder outfitted with a belt of vibration sensitive detectors. Weber's ideal was that um, a passing gravitational wave would induce mechanical vibrations in the cylinder, which would then be picked up by the detectors and converted into an electrical signal. 
1969, Weber published an article claiming that he had detected gravitational waves and claimed to have detected many waves in subsequent years. However, by about 1972 or so, there were serious doubts in the broader scientific community about the credibility of his results. And by the late 1970s, once other scientists had built several other gravitational det wave detectors around the world and systematically failed to detect gravitational waves themselves, as Cervantes Cota and colleagues put it, quote, everyone except Weber himself agreed that his proclaimed detections were spurious. How could this dispute between Weber and the other gravitational wave researchers be settled on epistemic grounds? Weber claimed that he had a functioning gravitational wave detector, and indeed that he had successfully detected gravitational waves many times over. The other researchers uh, thought he was mistaken and that his instrument wasn't doing what Weber claimed it was. But neither Weber nor the other researchers could reach for standard surrogate signals in order to settle the dispute about these instruments. Any, any empiricist epistemology of science, as opposed to uh, a rationalist one, bestows a key role on empirical results. In order to argue that the results of one's experiment are to be taken seriously, one has to argue that the experimental apparatus is working properly, but to argue that the apparatus is working properly, so says the regress, one demonstrate this, demonstrates that the apparatus has produced the expected correct results. Collins argues that is it, in, it is in virtue of this looping in experimental reasoning that social factors like power, prestige, and personality get traction in decisions about how the results of experiments are interpreted and received by researchers in the scientific community at large. So if Collins is right about the existence of this sort of regress, then the epistemology of experiment faces a serious problem. The experimenter's regress cannot be abolished by good research ethics alone. All fraud could cease, but social factors would still be required to truncate the regress. If social factors were to play the decisive role in the deliverances of science, then there is not much to recommend a special epistemic status for the enterprise in comparison to other human pursuits like art, politics, and myth-making. Although at times in the past, they have vehemently disagreed with one another. A few years ago, Harry Collins and Alan Franklin actually jointly wrote a paper um, in which they attempted to clarify shared common ground of endpoints of remaining disagreement. Even in this relatively conciliatory piece, Collins maintained that the epistemological criteria are not sufficient for establishing the existence of a new phenomenon like gravitational waves were in Weber's day. That is, Collins still maintains that sociological factors play significant roles in such deliberations. Franklin has responded extensively to Collins's discussion of Joseph Weber's attempts to detect gravitational waves, arguing that Weber's apparatus failed the relevant calibration tests. That is, before even worrying about the inferential gap involved in interpreting purported detections of novel phenomena, Weber's instrument had an opportunity to show that it was suitable for the task ahead and failed. Without handy gravitational wave standards, the detectors in these experiments were subjected to surrogate signals. As Franklin explains, quote, scientists injected pulses of acoustic energy into the antenna and determined whether their apparatus could detect such pulses. Weber's apparatus failed to detect the pulses, whereas each of the six experiments performed by his critics detected them with high efficiency. According to Franklin, the crucial difference between Weber's experiment and his competitors was the algorithm that he used to search for signals in his data. Weber's algorithm was nonlinear, while the competitors was linear. Weber was evidently concerned that a linear algorithm would miss the gravitational wave signals. And addressing this worry, the competitors also checked to see if using the nonlinear algorithm on their own data would yield the detection that Weber claimed. It did not. Franklin concludes that in light of Weber's failure to properly calibrate his instrument using plausible surrogate signals considered together with several other problems with Weber's analysis, the physics community rightfully rejected his, uh, his detection claims <clears throat> based on epistemological criteria. As you may know, the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for the observation of gravitational waves, not to Weber, uh, but rather to three other physicists for their contributions to the LIGO detector, the Laser Interferometer Gravity Gravitational Wave Observatory. The first detection came in 2015. Given the problems that we have just seen with Weber's efforts to detect gravitational waves, you might wonder what makes the LIGO researchers so sure that they have succeeded? Is that confidence well justified by the right sort of epistemic reasons, 
or did sociological factors, the lure of the Nobel Prize perhaps, um, play a decisive role? It seems to me that there are good epistemic reasons to take the LIGO results seriously, which in fact do have a lot to do with the role of surrogate signals in the preparation of the apparatus. I'll try to explain this very briefly. So remember that Collins's emphasis on the novelty of gravitational wave signals was supposed to cast doubt on the availability of appropriate surrogate signals to use in calibrating the gravitational wave detector. But the LIGO team did have surrogate signals that they argued were appropriate for testing the functioning of their instrument. The collaboration used something called hardware injections to mimic gravitational waves passing through the detector. LIGO is an interferometer. It works by carefully monitoring the lengths of two long arms. Because a passing gravitational wave would subtly change the lengths of these arms, the surrogate signal is induced by purposefully altering their length in a characteristic way by displacing the end test mass in the apparatus. In a truly fascinating episode, the LIGO collaboration designated a small number of its own researchers as the so-called blind injector group, who are allowed to secretly inject these surrogate signals into the detector during normal data taking. The rest of the collaboration would have to react to the signal not knowing whether it was, a, was real or faked and decide whether they were confident enough in the results to submit it for publication in a journal before the blind injection team revealed whether they had injected the signal. The scientists themselves were evidently worried about the possibility that the high stakes nature of their research could influence their reasoning in an unhelpful way. As two LIGO researchers put it, quote, our collaboration made the decision that the moment of potential discovery when emotions are running high and reputations are at stake is not the time to define a procedure for confirming a potential major scientific discovery. If a promising looking result came in, but the collaboration knew that it might be faked, they hoped that possibility would make them as careful and reasonable as possible in their analyses and interpreting the results. In fact, in 2010, LIGO detected a strong signal that looked like um, that expected from gravitational waves emitted by a pair of merging black holes. The collaboration named the signal the big dog because they'd inferred that it originated in the constellation Canis Major. For six months, they, lab they quote, labored over the data and ran through a suite of hardware checks. They developed new analysis tools and tried to figure out if the event was due to the, the instrument um, or other terrestrial noise and drafted a discovery paper, which they agonized over whether to call the result a detection an observation and discovery evidence, et cetera. And then finally at a collaboration meeting in which they reviewed all of the evidence, the paper draft and voted to submit the paper to a journal, the signal was revealed to be a surrogate. It had been intentionally injected in secret as a test by the blind injector group. Researchers um, Tanner and Weinstein describe how they felt after learning that the signal had been intentionally injected as follows. Quote, when Jay Marks opened his envelope in Arcadia in 2011 and told us all that the big dog was a big fake and that we had just completed the first successful discovery fire drill in gravitational wave observation history, we still treated it as a moment of celebration. We raised glasses of champagne and toasted our fake success. It was a strange, hollow feeling. But clearly, Big Dog had motivated a flurry of work, including big steps forward in our ability to measure the masses of the source objects, the neutron star or black hole, using only the gravitational wave signal. Most significantly, our collaboration had agreed for the first time what standards we'd use and how we'd minimize our biases. For the first time, we had decided that we had had enough evidence for a detection. So before I move on to discuss um, the epistemology of measurement and the role of commissioning in the epistemology of experiment, let me just first summarize where we've gotten so far. So I began by introducing Harry Collins's experimenters regress as a challenge to the epistemology of science. How can scientists tell whether they have successfully detected something without first knowing that they have a functioning detector? But how can they know that they have a functioning detector without first showing that the detector successfully detects whatever they're trying to detect in the first place? Then I described Alan Franklin's approach to neutralizing the regress. Franklin argues that calibrating an instrument with surrogate signals gives scientists good reasons to trust the results the instrument yields when applied to new cases. Indeed, even in cases where the signal to be detected is of a new type, as was the case for gravitational wave researchers until very recently. We saw how researchers design appropriate surrogate signals, as in the hardware injections for gravitational wave research. My own impression of this scholarly exchange between uh, Collins and Franklin is that Franklin is largely correct. 
scientists are often in a position to justify taking the results of their instruments seriously in virtue of prior work that has been done to properly calibrate those instruments using surrogate signals. At least for many cases, sociological factors like desire for power and prestige don't play the decisive role in determining when scientists take results seriously. Scientists take care to ensure that their instruments are functioning appropriately, and often enough that's sufficient for taking the results of those instruments, those instruments produced seriously. So I don't think that the challenge that the experimenter's regress poses to the epistemology of science ultimately succeeds. With that said, I want to now turn to some recent scholarship on the epistemology of measurement in connection with calibration that I think raises a different sort of challenge for the epistemology of experiment. So philosopher of science, Aaron Tal's sophisticated account of calibration complicates the interpretations I've presented thus far. Tal argues that we are mistaken to think of calibration primarily as adjusting the readout of one instrument to reflect that of a standard, concluding that, quote, comparison with a standard is neither necessary nor sufficient for successful calibration. If Tall's argument is correct, then it seems that we will have to revisit the responses to the threat of the experimenter's regress in order to see if compelling arguments against it can nevertheless be made without an understanding of calibration, um, sorry, with, even with an understanding of calibration modified by Tall's insights. So in order to do this, we better understand Tall's critique uh, of other accounts of calibration um, and the nature and implications of his own view. So adopting terminology from metrology, the science of measurement, Tall helpfully distinguishes between instrument indications and measurement outcomes. An instrument indication is the final state of a measuring apparatus, such as the position of a pointer uh, on a dial or the display of some readout. By itself, an instrument indication is of little use for gaining infra information about the measure end. In order to yield such information, an instrument indication must be interpreted in light of other information about the measuring context, notably a calibration function. On Tall's account, a measurement outcome refers to, quote, a claim that is inferred from one or more indications along with relevant background knowledge. To make a claim about the measure end, one must make an informed inference from the relevant instrument indications drawing on auxiliary information. The calibration of a caliper provides an illustrative example. Calipers facilitate the precise measurement of the diameter of workpieces by way of adjustable jaws that can be snugly fit around the piece whose diameter one wants to measure. You might think, as indeed I suggested earlier in this talk, that calibrating a caliper is straightforward. The scale on the caliper simply needs to be tuned so as to measure the appropriate diameter when applied to standard gauge blocks, that is, objects whose diameter has already been precisely determined. However, as Tall explains, a more accurate calibration of a caliper can be accomplished by what he calls white box calibration, which explicitly models factors that contribute to the caliper readout. For example, the roughness of the contact between the caliper and the workpiece, the resolution of the readout, the temperature of the workpiece, and so on. The more compli complicated calibration function that takes these aspects of measurement into account will improve measurement accuracy. Tall rightfully emphasizes that a widespread view of measurement fails to account for the epistemic significance of the work required to get a claim about the target from the state of a measuring instrument. Tall characterizes the traditional definition of calibration as the activity of establishing a correlation between the indications of a measuring instrument and um, quantity values associated uh, with a measurement standard like establishing a correlation between the value displayed on the caliper readout and the previously established diameter of the gauge blocks. But the vertigo inducing problem with this view is that the people trying to make measurements um, do not have access to the true values of the measure and to use as standards for calibration. How is the diameter of the gauge block itself established? This is starting to sound a lot like the experimenter's regress again. So at this point, following um, feast, it's actually helpful to distinguish between two regresses, or better yet, a circle in a regress. So first, there's a loop internal to an experiment um, or uh, measurement, which is what Collins has called the experimenter's regress. The apparatus is judged to be working correctly when it returns the appropriate result, and that result returned by the apparatus is appropriate, sorry, is um, and that the, apparatus, the result returned by the apparatus is appropriate is judged on the basis that the apparatus is working correctly. So in its most striking form, one judges that the phenomenon of interest has been successfully detected only when the detector is working properly, 
but one only has reason to believe that the detector is working properly when it successfully detects the phenomenon of interest. As we have already seen, this circle can be severed by calibration. The apparatus is judged to be working correctly by returning the appropriate signal um, when applied, or sorry, the appropriate result when applied to independently well-characterized surrogates. However, there's a second or perhaps proper regress, which Tal's epistemology illuminates. On what basis have the surrogates been well characterized? The surrogates used in calibration are well characterized by other applications of apparatuses that have themselves been calibrated on other well characterized surrogates, which have been well characterized by applications of apparatuses and so on. So this regress extends beyond the context of a single instrument. It traces the justification for taking results um, that, instrument, that instrument yields. <clears throat> um, all, all the way back. The epistemic problem here, um, the challenge to epistemology of science is that of course we don't have access to the true values of anything we're trying to measure in order to calibrate the first instrument that can be used to seed the chain of justification up through various surrogates and instruments to get the assurance that we want that the instrument we intend to use to measure an unknown value will produce results that we can justifiably take seriously. So here we might think about two philosophical views that one could have about the epistemology of measurement. One could adopt a kind of foundationalism with the hope that the regress bottoms out somewhere on sec secure epistemic foundations. Or one could adopt a coherentist view according to which measurements get their epistemic support by cohering with, one another, with other measurements in the right sort of way. As I've just suggested, foundationalism doesn't look promising in this context. Since we don't have access to the true values of measurements, it seems we don't have a secure foundation on which to build. Thinking about the calibration regress that extends beyond the, the context of a focal experiment, uh, a coherentist account of epistemic justification appears more promising than a foundationalist one. And indeed, Tall argues for a coherentist view of measurement. On his account, measurement in general is a modeling activity. To get a measurement outcome, one has to construct a model of the measuring process such that the instrument indication relates to a representation of the measuring. Model, uh, modeling measurements in this way is, according to Tall, what facilitates comparison of measurements across different specific contexts. Such comparison is essential to calibration. For Tall, quote, different measurement processes provide objective knowledge about the value of a quantity only once they have been idealized in a mutually coherent and consistent matter manner in terms of that quantity. A measurement then is a prediction of the value of the measurand by way of the, the idealized model of the measuring process. Measurements are validated insofar as they mutually cohere with predictions of the purportedly same measurand made with different models of measuring processes, that is properly informed measurement outcomes. By invoking these intermediary models of measurement processes, Tall claims to avoid the kind of oper operationalization that would isolate epistemologies of measurement to individual measurements. Calibration functions are therefore tools for predicting the value of the measurand from instrument indications. But if calibration is, as Tall argues, a web of mutually coherent measurement outcomes, can it effectively sever the experimenter's regress? Tall argues against traditional foundationalist views of measurement that confer special epistemic status to the measurement outcomes um, in virtue of their closeness to observation by human senses. Instead, Tall argues, drawing on the work of Kent Staley, that insofar as measurement outcomes serve a special role in generating scientific evidence, it's because of their, quote, security. Measurement outcomes are more secure in this sense, um, the less an epistemic agent expects them to require re revision in the future. If an agent has reason to suspect that an outcome is bound to be revised in the future, in the future that outcome is not very secure. This is certainly no foundationalism. However, for those who would, would take up this line of inquiry, I wanna offer a word of caution. A coherent web of dis, uh, web um, disconnected from causal contact with worldly targets will not do empirical science epistemic justice. Let me briefly say why I suspect this worry applies to Tell's epistemology of measurement and how, this view of me and how the view of measurement that um, Cossack Chang defends might be recruited to avoid it. So I suggest that Tall's emphasis on idealized models is misleading and that his blurring of the boundary between prediction and measurement is ultimately unhelpful. On his view, scientists predict the value of a measurand 
from an instrument indication via a model of the measuring process. Tull construes this as a benefit of his view and a topic worthy of further investigation. He writes, for instance, quote, another advantage of the model-based view is that it exposes the close relationship between measurement and prediction, which has thus far remained implicit in philosophical writings about measurement. Measurement and prediction are traditionally viewed as two distinct kinds of epistemic activity, the former concerning the observation of actual states of affairs, while the latter concerns the derivation of consequences from hypothetical assumptions. If the analysis presented here is correct, the boundaries between measurement and prediction are more permeable than previously supposed. Measurement outcomes are um, predictors that have been objectified through coherence, and measurement accuracy is a special case of predictive accuracy. These relationships between measurement and prediction suggest interesting new directions in the study of scientific evidence, as well as unexplored parallels between measurement in the natural and behavioral sciences. Indeed, he claims that, quote, the epistemic credentials of measurement are not different in kind from those of other modes of quantitative estimation, such as theoretical prediction and computer simulation. If measurements were to have the same epistemic function as predictions, the experimenter's regress would pose a very serious problem. In fact, the consequences of that unity would be epistemically catastrophic well beyond the scope of the regress. Calibration was supposed to disrupt the regress because an instrument could be judged to be working correctly in virtue of something other than the success of its principal aim. Support for the judgment that the gravitational wave detector is working correctly is supplied by noting its appropriate response to surrogate acoustic signals. In other words, the instrument is tested out on an input that has already been well characterized. In a measurement context, the caliper is judged to be working correctly, not when it yields some instrument indication and in, not merely when it yields some instrument indication in a new application, but when the caliper has been carefully calibrated using gauge blocks whose diameter has been measured by other procedures. That calibration procedure, even for common instruments like calipers, is best achieved by um, modeling rather than a linear fit between inputs and indications does not disrupt the important fact that the gauge blocks are needed to accomplish this procedure. Suppose, as Tall suggests, that measurements are just like predictions. It would then be possible to construe successful calibration, as in the new caliper readouts returns the appropriate value when applied to independently measured gauge blocks, along the lines of Tall's view in the following way. The predicted value of the measurand using the new model is coherent with the predicted value of the measurand using other models. I think this phrasing is jarring because we typically understand predictions in the manner Tall indicates in the extended quote I cited earlier as deriving from theory or hypothesis. Coherence between predictions cannot truncate the experimenter's regress because coherence between predictions can be achieved regardless of the state of the world. So without a distinction between theoretical predictions and empirical results, the evidential corpus floats free of the world from which it's supposed to inform us stranding us with nothing but the products of our own imaginations. It doesn't make sense of how the world pushes back on our theorizing, how nature can tell us when our predictions are wrong. So let me offer an alternative view of measurement outcomes that I think avoids this problem. As I've argued elsewhere, the epistemic utility of any empirical result depends on the details of its provenance, and this dependence is what makes comparison and amalgamation of results born out of different epistemic contexts possible. I suggest that we subsume the epistemology of measurement under this way of thinking about a broader class of activities, generating scientifically useful results from empirical data. Empirical results, such as parameter values, only gain epistemic utility when considered in the context of a whole line of evidence stemming from the empirical data from which they have been generated, together with information about the manner in which all of the results in that line of evidence were produced, the metadata regarding the provenance of the data records from which results are ultimately generated, and the metadata associated with the processing steps that transform data records into results. On the picture supplied by the enriched view of evidence, the epistemic utility of the result of a measurement depends on the assumptions baked into it. Those assumptions will inform the ways in which the result of the measurement may be responsibly deployed. Furthermore, the enriched view of evidence displays how measurement results can be revised when initial assumptions can come under further scrutiny. Suppose assumptions made about the roughness of surfaces in the application of a caliper end up being revised. 
By keeping track of what assumptions were made in generating a measurement result, one can then judge whether the subsequent revision of those assumptions affects the epistemic utility of the results for, for one's purposes. So if we understand measurement outcomes as empirical results in the manner I've just described, then we are not tempted to construe the comparison of measurement outcomes with theoretical predictions as a comparison of one prediction to another prediction. Rather, we can understand measurement outcomes as empirical results generated by cleverly processing data, in this case, records of instrument indications. The data are empirical in virtue of having been produced by a causal interaction involving the worldly target. The data produced by that initial interaction are not epistemically useful themselves. They need to be cajoled into a form that is relevant to the desired um, information. This cajoling is achieved by processing them, often by invoking models. Um, to put the results of such processing to epistemic use, one must consider them together with their enriching information. Theoretical and modeling assumptions are typically made in the course of data processing and interpreting empirical results, but this does not render those results predictions. Similarly, predictions can be empirically informed, but they are not themselves empirical results. Countenancing measurement outcomes <clears throat> as empirical results yields a picture of successful calibration that retains the essential role of the empirical. Consider an apparatus uh, that is new or of questionable functioning. Using background knowledge about the functioning of the apparatus, the processing, the processing used to generate results um, from it um, is adjusted so as to deliver appropriate results when applied to well-characterized surrogates. The results are deemed appropriate when they are consistent with the results delivered by prior applications of, uh, of other properly functioning apparatuses. Should new information <clears throat> bring the proper functioning of those prior apparatuses or other aspects of the background knowledge employed into question, the calibration should be adjusted accordingly. So while I think that conceiving of measurement outcomes as empirical results helps keep us clear on the distinctive epistemic roles that predictions and empirical results play and the way in which the natural world pushes back on our theorizing about it by empirical results, this approach does not obviously resolve the issue of the experimenter's regress. So does that mean that Tall is right after all? <clears throat> I think historian and philosopher of science, um, Hasek Chang's masterful study of the evolution of temperature measurements might seem at first glance to corroborate collapsing the distinction between theoretical predictions and empirical results. In particular, Chang's cases show that what is assumed, predicted, and measured can swap, pl can swap places as inquiry evolves. On the surface, this might look like looping with the attending threat of free-floating coherentism. But Chang argues that that um, there is genuine epistemic progress here. Rather than circles, these loops are spirals. Chang's view of progressive co coherentism relies on <clears throat> the engine of what he calls epistemic iteration. Starting from a system of knowledge that is affirmed without foundationalist justification, by iterative refinements, a type of progress is possible. Chang writes, quote, in the framework of coherentism, inquiry must proceed on the basis of an affirmation of some existing system of knowledge, the initial affirmation of an existing system of knowledge may be made uncritically, but it can also be made while entertaining a reasonable suspicion that the affirmed system of knowledge is imperfect. So in other words, scientists have to start somewhere and it doesn't have to be perfect in order for them to make progress. In the case of temperature, this start was affirming the reliability of human sensation for qualitative appraisal of hot and cold. Thermoscopes, later affirmed in part because they largely agreed with the pronouncements of sensation, could then be used to show that the, the limitations of sensation. Thus, on Chang's view, the starting point of inquiry is not retained unchanged, it is corrected and refined as the spiral emerges. Moreover, despite the swapping and spiraling, there's still a meaningful distinction to be made between theoretical predictions and empirical results within Chang's progressive coherentism. Pick a point on the spiral and one can discern the predictions from the results. The role that empirical results play in this progression could not be performed by theoretical predictions instead. In stating that computation can usefully be cast as a kind of measurement, Tall risks losing sight of the channels through which nature constrains our theorizing. It may be useful for identifying predictions and empirical results to distinguish them by the functional roles they play in the epistemology of science at a given point in Chang's spiral. 
However, it's not just anything that can play the role of an empirical result. It needs to be possible to tell a story about how the empirical result is causally downstream of the worldly target. So following Chang's approach, um, I think raises some interesting questions for further investigation. Suppose we adopt a kind of progressive coherentism. If scientists have to start somewhere, is that starting point arbitrary? And if so, um, must we accept strong pluralism about systems of scientific knowledge? Chang emphasizes that coherentism as an approach to the epistemology of science problematically lends itself to relativism. If scientists have to start somewhere, if they have to affirm some knowledge system to get the whole process started, might they just as well start in different places? And might that generate equally justified but different lines of inquiry? While Chang argues for progressive coherentism, not methodological anarchy or relativism, he does em embrace pluralism about scientific inquiry. He writes, quote, the point is not merely that we do not know which direction of development is right, but that there may be no such thing as the correct or even best direction of development. The pluralist aspect of Chang's view is fueled by the role he, by the role he allows non-empirical virtues like simplicity, elegance, and explanatory power to play. According to Chang, quote, there can be different ways of, of enhancing a certain epistemic virtue, for instance, explanatory power or quantitative precision and measurement that involve belief in mutually incompatible propositions. Generally speaking, if we see the development of existing knowledge as a creative achievement, then it is not so offensive that the direction of such achievement is open to some choice. But what gives these creative de developments any special epistemic status over other human achievements? I worry that in granting the non-empirical virtues such a strong role in determining the course of scientific developments, the epistemology of science does give way to the sort of relativism advanced by certain sociologists of science. To retain a distinctive epistemic status for scientific inquiry, the empir empirical adequacy <laughs> must remain the deciding epistemic virtue. Empirical adequacy cannot be one virtue among many, sometimes overshadowed by say elegance or simplicity. Um, subjecting theorizing to empirical constraints is essential to the scientific enterprise. And without that crucial piece, a coherentist approach to the epistemology of science will not be progressive in the right sort of way. So I also wonder if there are other non-foundationalist alternatives um, to Chang's approach that would emphasize this crucial role of empirical adequacy in comparison um, to considerations like simplicity and elegance. Okay, so I have a very tiny little bit of talk left for you um, uh, in which I wanna introduce this topic of commissioning, but I wanna check in right now. It's, it's really not that long, but I know this talk is kind of long. And so if you'd like me to stop now, this is a good place to stop. <laughs> Uh, no, if it's it's a if there's a, just a little more time, I think you should go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. So I want to briefly turn to a topic that I don't think has received due attention in philosophy of science, despite its proximity to other issues that I've already discussed um, today surrounding epistemic justification of scientific results and the role of calibration in the epistemology of science. So empirical research often relies on apparatuses to take um, that take some serious time and attention to get up and running for their proper use in science. Speaking broadly, we can break the preparation for an instrument for sorry for an experiment into a sequence of phases, design, construction and commissioning, which um, may include so called engineering runs and calibration. Depending on the nature of the experiment, there may be other preparatory phases too, such as prototyping and simulation. The commissioning phase in particular serves as a basis for the epistemic significance that the researchers accord to the results of their experiment. Roughly in scientific context, commissioning refers to the preparation of an apparatus for routine performance according to the aims of the research context. These days, at least for large collaborative experiments, uh, these research aims and the performance requirements they imply are often explicitly stated and published in design articles prior to the beginning of the construction of the experiment. Indeed, significant um, research is needed to specify these research aims and requirements in the first place. While the successes of the commissioning phase of an experiment might seem primarily pragmatic, these pragmatic wins have epistemic import. But generally speaking, there's two kind of particularly important benchmarks in a commissioning phase. Um, the first is when the apparatus is sufficiently assembled and functioning for basic operation. 
In the context of a telescope, for example, this is often referred to as first light, when the telescope is sufficiently a telescope to make some astronomical image. That image might be quite far from being of any serious scientific interest due to much required further work. Similarly, in accelerator physics like that conducted at the LHC, the first beam of an accelerator is celebrated when a beam can be successfully produced and steered through the entire instrument. A second important phase marks the transition from taking engineering data to science data. After the primary function of the instrument has been demonstrated, as in we can see something, operations still need to be developed and checked um, to have a hope of satisfying the aims of the experiment. The term commissioning is also used in primarily engineering contexts, such as the operation of nuclear power plants. Um, as one article explains, quote, the results of commissioning have to demonstrate that the requirements and intentions of the design and the intentions of the designers, as stated in the safety analysis report, have been met and that the unit is ready for long lasting and successful operational phase. The role of, commissioning phase in, of a commissioning phase in research contexts is not dissimilar. And this is no wonder since preparing an apparatus for science involves significant engineering work. For example, Richard Hills, the project scientist for the massive Chilean radio array ALMA, <clears throat> stated in a presentation to the ALMA Science Advisory Committee that quite simply the point of their commissioning efforts would be to quote, make the system into a telescope, one capable of making the specified astronomical observations. For ALMA, the commissioning phase involved um, design tests and debugging the electronics, antenna, um, uh, the infrastructure like power, as well as software. So like other aspects of experimental methods, um, the precise nature <clears throat> of the procedures used to transition an instrument from basically functional to the realization of its full science capabilities will vary with context and um, I think are worth investigating in detailed case studies. As a very brief illustration, consider the efforts of um, the Karlsruhe Tritium Neutrino Collaboration, or CATRIN, in the period between when they first injected the system with tritium and when they were confident enough to publish their first major science result, improving the upper limit on the neutrino mass. The purpose of CATRIN is to estimate the mass of the electron antineutrino by measuring the shape of the endpoint of the energy spectrum of beta decay electrons from tritium. Solar neutrino experiments demonstrating that neutrinos oscillate between the three flavors imply that neutrinos are not massless <clears throat> as stipulated by the standard model of particle physics. Tritium beta decays yield helium-3, an electron, and an electron antineutrino. So by studying the energy spectrum of the electrons produced in these decays, the Katrin collaboration hopes to look, um, it does look, for a small distortion in the tail of the spectrum where the non-zero mass of the electron antineutrino should nibble away at the energy that otherwise would have been imparted to the electron. The Katrin experiments aim to measure this neutrino mass with a sensitivity of 0.2 eV. <clears throat> The, the 70 meter long Katrin apparatus includes uh, the windowless gaseous tritium source from which the tritium decays, a transport and pumping section through which the beta decay electrons are guided by superconducting magnets to the main spectrometer. The main spectrometer vessel is a stainless steel tank of 1,400 meter cubed in volume, weighing about um, 200 tons, which is supposed to maintain ultra high vacuum. And the mass spectrometer transports only electrons whose uh, kinetic energy is above a certain threshold, which can be altered by the experimenters. And then finally, there's this um, focal plane detector uh, at the end, which counts the electrons. So with the beamline components in place in 2016, the collaboration tested the alignment of the magnets, demonstrating that the instrument could transport electrons and ions and also block positive ions. The following year, they tested spectroscopic performance with a krypton source and check the, the calibration of their high voltage system to parts per million level. Satisfied with these preliminary commissioning procedures, the calibration was ready to introduce tritium into the system. In the so-called first tritium campaign or FT campaign, the source was limited to 0.5% of operational activity by mixing the tritium with pure deuterium as a safety precaution. And that campaign demonstrated the stability of several key parameters of the experiment. Um, allowed the experimenters to compare various analysis strategies testing, um, test their calculation software uh, and investigating and allowed them to investigate various sources of systematic error and indeed discover higher than anticipated backgrounds due to um, an incomplete bakeout. So recall Collins's regress, right? Um, explicating the threat of regress um, 
in this way portrays the experimenter's efforts to check that the instrument is working as needed to perform an experiment of interest and the experiment itself as identical. This is deeply misleading because experimenters do a lot of work to assure themselves that their experimental apparatus is ready for science applications before they're willing to record um, data that they will take seriously. Calibration, often lots of it, is generally part of what, happening, what happens during the commissioning phase of an experiment um, when this preparatory work is accomplished. The calibration procedures um, may feature in the experiment throughout its operational phase, not just at the beginning. Calibration is part of what happens during commissioning, but neither exhausts the activities of commissioning nor is limited um, to the confines of that phase of the experiment. As we could see from the Katrin campaign, um, which was only one dramatic part of a longer commissioning phase, the test checks and troubleshooting that occurred during commissioning are important aspects of the epistemic support that experimenters offer for their, for their ultimate results. In this phase, the experimenters, engineers, and technicians attempt to demonstrate that, that the instrument as built can in fact perform um, to design specifications demanded by their science goals. Um, they try out different experimental strategies, finalize decisions about how to run the intended experiment, they encumber um, unanticipated difficulties uh, and do what they can to understand and remedy them. The critical work accomplished in this phase furnishes some of the important arguments that the researchers need in order to justify their ultimate interpretations. So I, I think philosophers interested in the epistemology of experiment um, should look beyond um, the, the rather narrow phase of calibration to this much more extended and intricate um, phase of commissioning. Okay. So in the second half of the talk, I introduced you to some of Arantal's um, recent work on the epistemology of measurement, arguing that it raises new challenges for the epistemology of experiment. In particular, I suggested that while Tall's account helpfully illuminates the intricate ways that models are used to accurately calibrate even relatively simple instruments like calipers, his account unhelpfully blurs the distinction between predictions and measurements. Without that distinction, I worried that a coherentist epistemology of measurement like Tall's risks becoming insensitive to the world pushing back on our theorizing about it. I suggested that Chang's progressive coherentism might help us stress this worry, but also wondered if non-empirical virtues ultimately play too strong a role in Chang's view to furnish a well-justified epistemology. Finally, I noted that while philosophers of science um, have explored calibration and its role in the epistemology of experiment, the importance of the commissioning phase um, has thus far been underappreciated. And um, in my own future work on this topic, I plan to explore the result of commissioning in, in the preparation of another difficult research context, um, the study of the so-called cosmic dawn using 21 centimeter cosmology, and in particular, um, the preparation for the square kilometer array. I hope that by carefully studying the role of commissioning activities in science and practice, that I'll be able to more clearly and more specifically articulate the nature of this type of activity and its function in the epistemology of science. Thank you for listening to my very long talk. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Still Nora. awake. <laughs> uh, that was a wonderful talk. I, I don't think the uh, length or something reminded. Um, so, um, yeah, so I can now open up the floor to questions. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please uh, use the uh, raise hand function uh, on Zoom and um, uh, I'll, I'll queue up for questions and I'll come to you uh, once I do. Uh, Vishal, uh, would you like to ask something? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Nora, for that wonderful presentation. So uh, I'd like to ask that uh, probably you were talking about uh, diachronic calibration. So if we you know, think about synchronic calibration, at least for the cases where the signal is very rare, uh, such as uh, take the example of LIGO observation of gravitational wave. So there must have been multiple observatories, uh, you know, at various other places. So there can be a sense of synchronic uh, calibrations amongst these uh, uh, other uh, LIGO apparatuses. So that can triangulate upon error if present. So one, uh, so is uh, synchronic calibration uh, providing a superior alternative to diachronic calibration? The second question is, uh, is simplicity a, essentially a non-epistemic virtue? Because uh, now there are certain objective standards uh, like Kolmogorov complexity, which you know, objectively captures the idea of simplicity. 
so if you know we can objectively create a notion of simplicity can it be converted into an epistemic virtue so these are the two questions thank you yeah thank you um so on um synchronous calibration i mean you it's true that the like the ligo um and advanced ligo and virgo the, that larger instrument has all of these different um you know stations around the world and the idea is that um you get sort of extra assurance um, that you've actually detected an astrophysical signal by having coincident um, detections across um, the planet as opposed to just in a single detector. And that sort of idea of um, coincident detections is something that, you know, uh, physicists, experimental physicists use in lots of contexts for lots of reasons. Um, you also get, you know, fabulous extra information about um, the, this is what makes the LIGO or advanced LIGO Virgo situation a telescope in a sense is that you can, you know, using that timing differential information across these different stations, then <clears throat> um, use that to localize where the signal is coming from in space, right? But I wouldn't necessarily call all of that um, calibration. Um, I mean, I think if I'm imagining, okay, what would synchronous calibration be? Um, you know, two detectors tr trying to, um, I mean, what, what would be the standard signal there? I mean, it seems to me like you run into the same sort of epistemic problem that, um, that we've been talking about, right? Like, you know, what, bef you know, in absence of the, Sig the very signal you're trying to detect, um, how are you assured that your, your detector is functioning properly? That doesn't necessarily change if you add more detectors um, to break that sort of the experimenter's regress problem there, you really need surrogate signals that um, ensure that you've, uh, you know, give you prior, epistemically prior reason to think that um, the detector is functioning properly. Now, maybe you have in mind something like, like a kind of robustness argument, you know, um, like forget surrogates. If I, um, detect the same signal across multiple instruments, doesn't that give me, uh, a kind of epistemic assurance that I've got the, the signal that I think I have? Um, I'm still worried in that in that kind of case, right? Because if you have a bunch of garbage instruments, right? And they all, even if they all say the same thing, <laughs> you shouldn't trust them, right? But like the <laughs> self isn't um, good enough, right? Um, you, you'd really like to know that, uh, you'd really like to have some other assurance that the detector is working properly. So I guess I'm, I, I don't think that, um, you know, sort of robustness or, or uh, kind of convergence results in itself do, d does the same sort of epistemic work as calibration. Um, and this makes me think of a really um, lovely argument in the climate science literature, right, about, um, you know, what, what do we learn when climate models agree, right, about like predictions for the future or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, not if we don't trust the climate, if we don't have good reason to trust the climate models in the first place, right? Um, the agreement itself doesn't really help. So I hope that, okay, so, and then your second question was about um, objective uh, accounts of simplicity and whether simplicity might be considered an epi properly epistemic virtue. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about this. I think that, you know, there are, there are a variety of ways that, um, folks have tried to, um, you know, get really specific about what simplicity is supposed to mean. And we have various ways of measuring simplicity. Like, um, I don't know, you, you guys probably, maybe you know this better than I do, like the BIC and the AIC or whatever, and, you know, all these different um, fancy statistical tools. And um, you might be able to make different arguments for uh, why those tools are interesting to you in some specific epistemic context. Um, but I think that the, the, the sort of underlying worry that I have is, um, 
you, when, we're make, we're, when we use simplicity as an epistemic virtue, we're making an assumption, we're making an unjustified assumption about the way nature is. Like we have no, um, we have no reason to think that um, nature is simple. I mean, it might be like pragmatically useful for us um, to, you know, start with, um, you know, simple hypotheses or simple models uh, as measured by some well-specified um, simplicity criterion. And I think, you know, doing that work of specifying the criteria that we're using and communicating about that to each other, um, you know, helps uh, scientists, you know, like judge what, yeah, what different people are actually claiming about their research. But um, so I think it can be useful, but at the same time, I just think that like <laughs> that kind of crucial uh, piece about why, why we should think that nature is simple is missing. I mean, why should nature be simple? We don't, <laughs> it might not be. <laughs> so yeah, um, right. trying to capture the wrong thing. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Bashar. Um, any other questions people would like to ask? Mike, did you have a question that you want to ask? Yeah, I mean, hi, Nora. I shouldn't be stealing this time away from these winter school students who, uh, you know, hey, <laughs> dedicated all their time to this. But anyways, um, yeah, I just uh, couldn't resist asking a question um, that has been bothering me for a long time, and you're, you're the expert. So this experimenter's regress, to me, kind of just sounds like an instance of the super general skepticism that we have in regular kind of mainstream epistemology about the basic mm -hmm. grounds for like epistemic claims or epistemic value. And so, you know, you have foundationalism and coherentism and correspondence and all this stuff. And we have the same versions for experiments and, and science and, and so on. And so there's this one proposed solution, which is that actually we're aiming too high. The reason why we have, the reason why you can always be skeptical is because, uh, you never know for sure if you've got the truth or something like that, or if you're tracking the truth. And if you soften the aim a bit, and this is going to connect to Tatum's lecture tomorrow and then the stuff on understanding, if you soften the aim a bit and you say, well, we're not trying to get exact correspondence with reality or something like that. We just want like understanding or successful manipulation. And this is maybe why, as you were talking, I was thinking about Hasak and then you brought up Hasak and I'm like, yeah, it makes sense because he's not trying to get correspondence to reality. He's got this softer view where we have pragmatic coherence and successful manipulation and abilities and so on. So I just kind of want to know what you think. Do you think um, this sort of strategy is on the right track that actually the regress problem kind of goes away a bit if you just um, relax the or lower the epistemic bar? Is that something we should be doing? Or do you think the problem just comes back just the same if you're, a, let's say, a factivist about understanding or something? Thank you. That's a really, um, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, my, my own position is that, um, like, I don't want to lower the bar yet. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think if we, like, it feels like settling to me to settle for understanding or successful manipulation, right? Because we could have, um, you know, we can get a, a kind of, I mean, it obviously it depends on your account of understanding and that's a letter tried no, um, absolutely nothing about. So <laughs> you all can tell, you all can tell me about it, but, um, you know, if, if we, if the, if the account of understanding, um, that we have in mind here leaves out this piece about aiming at truth, um, then I think, you know, and, and similarly for, successful manip manipulation, right? Like we can have all kinds of false theories that um, allow us to successfully manipulate, right? Um, but, you know, if that piece gets left out, I think we lose, um, yeah, I think we lose this, the distinction between science and other human activities. And I'm tempted to, you know, ask, 
why, I mean, science is really hard, <laughs> right? Like trying to get these things right is incredibly hard. And sort of like, if we're just, if we're just going for understanding or getting around well in the world or something, like why go through all this trouble? <laughs> we have plenty of other options about, you know, we, ways that we could, we could all take a vacation instead or whatever, <laughs> you know, and like make our lives easier. Um, so I think that the, you know, keeping aiming at the truth is really, really important. Um, but I, but I do agree that, um, it's not, it's not super clear how this is supposed to work. Right. Um, so I am, I'm wor working on an empiricist epistemology of science that tries, you know, that tries to keep that piece in view, but I come out, you know, a, a kind of anti-realist in the end, because I don't think we're ever in a position to judge that we've, um, arrived at the truth. And so we're always, you know, sort of like Boston Frost and style, like we're always striving um, for it. And that is the appropriate aim to strive for. Um, and it, and it, you know, it explains why, you know, the empirical adequacy thing is so important. Um, but, um, but I think it's, yeah, I do think it's really crucial for like, if, the goal is really learning about the way nature really is. Um, we've got to keep this piece in mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I, in my own sort of thinking about the epistemology of science, I end up saying stuff like, well, you know, what we learn from science, so what we learn from science is not the true theory at the end of the day, but we learn, we, we sort of accumulate this growing evidential corpus, this growing body of evidence, and we learned that any viable theory, meaning any um, empirically adequate theory will have to be consistent with that growing body of evidence. And this is actually like quite a strong um, constraint on viable theorizing. So I think that's the way in which we can make sense of epistemic progress in science, <clears throat> even if we don't kind of come to the true theory. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I have to think about it. <laughs> I admire your ambition. <laughs> let's keep the bar high. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Well, and let's check back in 20 years or whatever. What yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So uh, like I said, if there are others who have questions, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, Tarun, not this Tarun, but the other Tarun. P Tarun. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Nora. So uh, thank you for the well-structured talk. I particularly like uh, the uh, post-section summary, this idea of summarizing the key ideas of each section. Uh, that reminds me of a virtue that the book that taught me to read says that a good author always summarizes themselves as they go along. Uh, and of course, um, so my questions are uh, essentially two. The first one is a small question, and uh, it's this. So earlier on in your talk, uh, you were talking about how... Uh, sociologists of science and philosophers of science presented two contending perspectives on what it is that influences experimental decision-making and inferences that scientists make. So my question is then, is I drew a conclusion from that part of your talk. Please tell me if this is accurate, if this is an accurate conclusion to draw. Scientists' decisions are influenced both by sociological factors and by epistemological factors, and which specific factors are at play in a particular instance of scientific decision making is, I mean, is dependent on uh, uh, is dependent on that particular instance. So the general idea is that yes, both social and epistemological factors uh, influence scientific decision making, not just from experiments, but probably even other ways of knowledge creation as well. Uh, but the specific uh, context matters for us to know um, which influence is stronger or which influence is present or absent. Yeah. So, so let me let me let me kind of like back up and say a little bit about the um, uh, the approach that I'm taking here. So, I mean, we could. So you can imagine, you know, broadly speaking, there could be a descriptive sort of project in epistemology of science, or there could be a prescriptive project in epistemology of science, right? Like we could sort of take a socio-historical perspective and try to just figure out, you know, how is it that scientists reason? 
And, um, you know, in fact, when they make decisions about, say, when to publish on a new discovery, do uh, what sorts of um, uh, considerations influence those decisions? So in order to do that project, we'd go out and like, you know, watch a lot of scientists, read a lot of lab notebooks, do a bunch of interviews and stuff and figure out what are they doing. Um, but then you could also be interested in a prescriptive project in epistemology of science, which is like, well, sort of regardless of how scientists in fact reason, how ought they reason, how should they reason? And, you know, using our superpowers as um, philosophers of science, could we kind of develop a very clean, well-justified epistemology of science and then hand that over to the scientists and tell them that this is how you should reason. Now, these are the way I've presented these options. Um, they're, uh, you know, they're kind of like poles at some, uh, at opposite ends of some spectrum, right? And you could imagine that there are kind of middle ground approaches. And I think that, you know, uh, philosophy of science in, you know, the, in previous decades has been um, uh, too sort of abstract and prescriptive um, in a way that was ultimately like just kind of disconnected from anything that vaguely resembled actual science, right? I mean, um, you know, I don't like to be hard on Hempel because Hempel's really uh, a super smart dude, <laughs> way smarter than I am. And like, you know, and, and he's actually more subtle than this, but you can you can sort of um, just as a, as a kind of caricature, I think about the ways in which, you know, the, theory and evidence get related in a kind of um, logical empiricist type view. And um, it just doesn't really look like anything kind of recognizable as science in practice. So that, that's the danger of taking a prescriptive approach that's divorced from science in practice. Um, but on the other hand, like, you know, if you take this kind of purely descriptive approach, um, you, you just get saddled with whatever it is that the scientists happen to be doing, which is sometimes not very great, right? Like we saw with the bicep two example, you know, sometimes these folks screw up and, um, uh, and then admit it sometimes, you know, and like there's fraud every once in a while, but there's also just sort of like bad reasoning sometimes. Um, so I think we do want this middle ground where we have, um, where we, where we're trying to build an epistemology of science that stays relatively close to what actual science looks like, how actual science proceeds in practice, but at the same time maintains this kind of critical distance so that, um, we have the space to identify, um, mistakes in reasoning when they happen and to offer kind of the prescriptions in where it's appropriate. So um, that's the sort of game that I'm playing here and that some other folks like, um, you know, uh, Arantal and um, Slobodan Provic and, and other folks are, are doing too. Um, and so from that kind of middle ground view, when, um, when we see um, you know, a case where it looks like the sociological factors or the social factors, like some scientist's reputation, like the power of some scientist's, scientist's reputation or like the greed for the Nobel Prize or something is playing a substantive role in the reasoning that those scientists um, are using to assess their results, then I think we we have, I mean, I think I think we have the resources to like call that out and 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 show that it's gone wrong. I think the, you know, the very sort of strongest version of the sociologist stance is that, and this is to kind of, it's just to caricature it, but is that um, you know there there just aren't these cases <laughs> um, that the philosopher hopes for where the, where it's good epistemic reasons that are driving scientific reasoning they're 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 going to say like look it just it just always bottoms out in um, sociological factors and it's for that reason that like 
scientific reasoning isn't above other forms of human reasoning or isn't, you know, science isn't like a special kind of activity that, um, you know, the knowledge production of which we should take especially seriously or something. Um, and so that's, that's the sort of view that I want to resist and other folks want to resist too. And I think the way to do that is um, to show that, you know, to, to show sort of abstractly what, insofar as you can give a general abstract um, uh, characterization, what um, the strategies are for giving good reasons in science. And then um, to kind of assure ourselves via case studies and interacting with um, science and practice that like, this isn't tremendously rare that like, you know, <laughs> that, we're, that we're still being fairly descriptively ad adequate to science to say that like, you know, in many cases, this, this kind of good reasoning that we would prescribe as philosophers is, is what's happening. Um, does that help? <clears throat> yeah, it does, but another related clarification. So uh, you said that uh, it's, it's good to have an epistemology of science. I mean, uh, or rather, you said that uh, science, the way that it operates uh, in the real world isn't necessarily, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily correspond to the epistemology of science that philosophers are creating. Then one question then, um, should science be influenced more by social factors or by epistemological factors? I mean, I think this is a question that the creators of science would have thought of. I mean, should we let this way of reasoning, this way of thinking about the world be influenced by social factors and or only by epistemological factors? Yeah. My own stance on this is that I think it's uh, some social influence is inevitable. But I would say that science should probably try to maximize its epistem epistemological uh, um, virtues or epistemological justifications um, while keeping in mind what uh, social factors are inevitably influencing it. Yeah, um, this is also a really good question. And I take it from uh, looking at your program for the for the winter school, it looks like you're going to talk a bunch more about, um, you know, social epistemology and science and then values in science later on too. So I think you'll continue to have these discussions throughout the week. Um, and the values in science literature is super interesting and you should totally dig into that and like see what's going on there. Um, yeah, so he, here's my take. Like, I think, um, you know, someone like Heather Douglas is <laughs> pretty much right about um, values in science. Like they're, um, there are, uh, so, and we might want to distinguish between like lots of different ways in which values or sort of non-epistemic considerations might enter into scientific decision-making. And I think some of these are going to be um, epistemically detrimental and some of them are going to be not, you know, not only not de detrimental, but like actually just necessary for the well-functioning of science. So, um, you know, I think like the case I gave you of the bicep two um, cosmologists where they're just like scrambling for the prize, for the Nobel prize. And, you know, the, that sort of greed and fear of their competition takes over and they do this like really sketchy data analysis. There's an, there's an exa clear example where um, a certain kind of values, certain kind of sociological factors, like you know, desire for power and recognition and the ultimate capital or whatever clouded their judgment and, um, and induced these missteps. I think there's other examples where um, sort of uh, values can um, bias scientific reasoning in an epistemically detrimental way as when, um, you know, our biases determine how, you know, the outcome of what the outcome of the research is, is interpreted to be, as opposed to the world pushing back through, through the empirical um, evidence, right? But but at the same time, there, there I think there are cases, and I'm sure you'll read about this and talk about this more in the values and science session, but like where, um, where we really do need to sort of bring in um, our, uh, 
reasoning about you know what we care about in the social sphere into scientific reasoning. So um, a classic example is like um, you know what sort of threshold um, statistical threshold should we um, use in order to determine whether a um, treatment is safe for children or something like that, or a, you know, a, a, um, like a, some kind of new chemical is safe for, you know, use in, I don't know, like our pillows or whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? So there, there might be standards based on, you know, the fact that we, we have a choice about what sort of where to put statistical thresholds, right? Like, do we want, I mean, the, even, even in physics, they make these choices um, and have to make arguments for them. Like, you know, do you want a five sigma threshold for dis scientific discovery, um, like in uh, particle physics, or do, will a three sigma signal as in astronomy um, satisfy you? And so these kind of choices have to be made and have to be hashed out within the community. And I think that there are certain applications of, of, of science that, you know, it really like the relevant information that should inform those decisions about where to set these kinds of thresholds in our analyses are, you know, have to do with like the things that we care about. So at any rate, there, there certainly are places where um, values enter into science. And I don't think that that always, or even often it is um, epistemically detrimental. Um, yeah, um, I feel like there was one more thing I wanted to say about that. Um, maybe it'll come back to me. <laughs> uh, God, what was it? Yeah, sorry, I've forgotten. I'll try and remember. Okay, thank you, uh, Karan. Uh, any other questions? I don't see any hands at the moment, so maybe I'll take this. Oh, 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 I remembered. I totally remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it took a little while. There we go. I got it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was um, I wanted to mention uh, kind of cases where I think um, social considerations or non maybe non-epistemic considerations enter into scientific decisions that um, I think is really interesting and deserves a lot more attention, uh, attention and work from philosophers of science. So um, I'm thinking of the, so I, I think a lot about uh, cosmology, astrophysics, and astronomy, and there are these like huge problematic issues in sighting telescopes and um, on planet earth because <laughs> that involves social, social reasoning because you know, oftentimes, you know, where do you want your telescope? You want it on the tallest, most awesome mountain so that you can get really good seeing. But often those mountains are the very ones that are sacred to indigenous peoples, right? And this happens in Hawaii, this happens in Arizona, this happens all over the place. Um, or, you know, even for like large radio arrays like the, um, the SKA that I mentioned at the end of my talk, um, similar kind of considerations um, can arise where you're trying to cite a very large, and I mean, in India, I was reading about this very briefly the other day, you all have this um, uh, um, debate about a neutrino observatory, right? And whether it should be, whether large hunks of a sacred mountain should be blasted out in order to house this neutrino observatory. And then, so that debate is happening for you all too. And I think that this is, um, you know, this is a case where like, you know, so the, uh, the epistemic reasons here would push for citing these um, telescopes and instruments and observatories in these places, right? Because the, the, the engineers and scientists have figured out that these are the optimal locations given feasibility constraints about where these things should be cited in order to um, move, move the science forward. But, that, but those aren't the only <laughs> relevant considerations <laughs> for citing these things, right? Like we really do need to take into account um, what, uh, you know, whose land is involved, what kind of, um, what kind of aims and, uh, they have for that land and what kind of permissions they, they are willing to grant with respect to that land. We have to take in, you know, to account free prior and informed consent, right. And real genuine, um, 
uh, conversation with folks about land use in cases like this. And I think I think in these cases we have to take the um, you know the cultural and spiritual value of certain places very seriously too in these decisions. So that's just another example of an instance where I think it's very clear that um, what you might call social factors should influence scientific decision making. Um, and and might and we might might actually come at an epistemic cost, right? Like we might not be able to get as a scientific community the very best um, em empirical results that we might hope for. But I think this is a again like a kind of different type than um, the cases where you know bias determines the outcome of a result. Uh, or, um, you know, like the case of the BICEP2 experiment where, you know, that they, they made these mistakes in reasoning or hasty reasoning because um, they were driven by a desire for power. And I think those, those are the ones that, you know, for epistemology of science, we really ought to kind of pay attention to and like try to, you know, do enough um, research about science and practice as it's actually conducted to uh, investigate whether or not, you know, the, the extent to which those kinds of things are widespread. But, yeah. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> any other uh, uh, questions from any of the other participants? Um, all right. So, uh, under the assumption that I'm not stepping on the feet of any other participants, let me. Uh, ask a question. Uh, this is maybe um, a follow-up to uh, one of the questions that was asked earlier. Um, and uh, that is so, so when you, so the way the experimenters regress is framed according to Collins is that there's this kind of epistemological, I guess, slack created by the fact that you have this regress, which so there's some kind of there's this multiple ways you can go, multiple decisions you can reach at, reach each of which is self-justifying. And that slack then allows for these non-epistemic factors to enter, right? Uh, prestige or power or whatever to it kind of occupy that space. Um, now, I, I guess it seems like framing the problem in those terms, it's framing the problem in terms of, you know, is is it possible to get rid of all this slack? And uh, uh, if it is, uh, if it isn't, then you know science is kind of this is, is not really epist epistemic. It's non-epistemic. Um, I think that's kind of uh, conceding already too much because I think even the alternatives you canvas to at the end, uh, uh, Chang's alternative, and so on, they don't do away with any kind of slack you might have. I mean, there's still, as you mentioned when you were discussing Chang's. Uh, own solution. There, there might be multiple starting points, and those starting points could take us in different directions. If there's pluralism, that's a form of slack already. Um, and so I guess maybe because this problem originated with a sociologist, maybe the, that's why it's framed this way, but it seems a little weird to frame it as either we have this kind of epistemological account, which has no slack at all, which I think everything we know about philosophy of science suggests that that kind of aspiration is not going to happen. Or we have to you know, say that you know, it's all prestige and social power and things like this. I guess, yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And prob you know, probably uh, in part, you're just seeing like me trying to frame it in a stark way <laughs> too. So um, yeah, but I, I totally agree. And I think, um, yeah, so right, we're, we, I certainly agree that we're never in the no slack position, right? In actual scientific reasoning, there's always slack. And I think um, the we, we just have to say sort of like, you just have to do, um, you know, the good faith effort <laughs> um, best that you can in the, you know, in the moment that you have with, you know, the information that you can wrestle up and the expertise that you can access. It's just like, there's nothing more to say. I mean, you, you just have to do the very best that you can do given, given what you, you can. Um, and I think it's interesting that there are, you know, like we see this in times of 
uh, disputes within the scientific community where one party is calling on some other party saying, you know, look, you're not, you're not doing the good faith effort. You're, you, there are these problems with your methods that you haven't addressed and you need to track them down. And we're not going to take your results seriously until you do. And then people either, you know, uh, rise to that challenge or they don't. And the scientific community responds accordingly. So I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, there's so many cool cases that we could talk about here. I mean, one that comes to mind for me uh, immediately is this um, Dama, Dama Libre um, dark matter detection uh, example. So there's these folks in Gran Sasso who have been claiming to have detected um, a signal of um, dark matter uh, for years at this point. And um, the scientific community just doesn't believe them. And in part, they don't believe them because the collaboration, the Dama Libra folks are being extraordinarily secretive about their methods, the data, the analysis, the particular, like, I kid you not, crystals that they're using in the, in this experiment. To, so without the kind of transparent access to some of these stages of scientific reasoning and some suspicions about um, possible backgrounds that could be showing up as signals instead in this experiment, the scientific community is like not having it. Um, and I think what would remedy that situation would be to like, you know, really subject that experiment to the kind of scrutiny that the that other scientists are calling for, you know, to have, you know, to, you know, replicate the instrument and try it in different places and open up the analysis and show everybody the data and try and track down these other things. But I, but I mean, I think, I think it's true that I write about this in the um, in the Cambridge Element book in a bunch of different uh, kind of classic historic cases from philosophy of uh, or from from uh, experimental physics like um, like literally boil in the air pump you know there's and there's this you know as you know like this famous um, book on Leviathan in the air pump where we have um, you know just this this fantastic. Uh, example of dispute, um, even at that time about, you know, precisely this issue of is the, is, you know, when someone else can't produce your result, is it because there's something wrong with the apparatus or is it, you know, that they're, that they're, that one of these people is right and the other pe person is wrong. You know what I mean? So um, I think, you know, I think you see this kind of reasoning pop up in the um, Eddington, the Eddington Eclipse expedition, the huge debate about like whether Eddington and Dyson rightfully threw out the Sabral astrographic plates be, and, you know, claims that, oh, they threw them out because, um, you know, for sociological reasons, like they were trying to uphold Einstein because of the war and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but, but I think um, Daniel Kenefick has done this uh, de detailed study on this recently and like, you know, it looks like actually, you know, there were just <laughs> sort of to to any sort of honest reasoner, there would there were good reasons um, to think that that data wasn't going to be useful for the purposes that they had at, at, at the time. So I think we that's I mean, that's basically what I want to say is just that, you know, uh, we have to sort of get in the weeds um, as scientists and as philosophers of science to figure out what reasoning has happened here. Are there ways that we could think, you know, of pieces that have been missed or mistakes that have been made? Um, and can we, can those be remedied in any kind of way? Um, and that, and I think part of the real benefit of my, this view of enriched evidence that I sketched quickly in the, in the talk is that, um, it makes it clear how like, okay, you, we're never gonna be totally assured that it was, you know, that we've tracked down every possible source of noise, right? I mean, it's just a, it's just like a truly endless, this is, this, this is the slack. Like there's always gonna be that little slack, even if we have the best experimenters who have subjected their reasoning experiment to everything they can possibly think of for years and years and everybody else has looked at it and there's always gonna be some kind of slack. And, um, and so I think, what we have to say is like, you know, it might be, uh, and this is partially why I'm an anti-realist at the end of the day, like it just might be that like 
um, we come to lear- learn later on that we missed something and that the epistemic significance of the results that we had has to be revised. And so I think it's actually really important um, for the epistemology of science to keep track of the assumptions that go into um, an empirical result so that when, you know, new information comes to light and we have to revise um, our results, we can sort of try and recover, you know, the the new significance of that result in light of what we've learned by kind of like backtracking through that reasoning and revising stuff. Um, So, um, so I have some like fun examples in other work where that happens for like even very old, like Babylonian eclipse records, people have, you know, revived them in contemporary contexts in order to um, constrain contemporary theorizing by sort of yeah, reviving and revising and reprocessing these results, um, even across radically different, you know, paradigms and across many scientific revolutions, right? So, um, so yeah, I think um, we just, you know, at the end of the day, we might be wrong. And um, if we keep track of sort of how the decisions were made and kind of keep that metadata around, then um, we stand a chance of, um, of, you know, recovering some epistemic significance from that, from those results. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, all right, so I think we are uh, more or less out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Nara, for uh, not just a great talk, but for spending so much time discussing things with us. Uh, that was uh, very useful and really fun. Um, so thanks a lot. And uh, as for the participants, we will see you all tomorrow morning at 10 again. Um, Yeah. Goodbye, everyone. That's it. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the school. Yeah.